Now let's look at the process of fertilisation itself. And this is a tricky business for the sperm to accomplish. When it arrives at the egg, as we've seen, the egg is surrounded by the corona radiata cells. So the sperm has to push its way between these cells in order to reach the surface of the egg. And that surface is represented by an acellular layer called the zona pellucida. So the sperm has to eat its way through the zona in order to approach the egg. Once through the zona, it finds itself in the perivitelline space and only then, finally, can it attach to the plasma membrane of the egg and make its way inside the egg itself. Now, this demanding process is one that can sometimes go wrong. So in in vitro fertilization techniques, as part of assisted reproduction, it may be necessary to help the sperm through the corona, indeed through the zona, and perhaps even through the plasma membrane. And we'll illustrate that later. So here we see the process of fertilization having taken place. And since we've now finally managed to bring together our egg and sperm, the second meiotic division of the egg can also take place. Once the sperm has entered the egg, a series of signals make the zona pellucida impermeable. And ideally, what will happen is that if one sperm has reached the egg and fertilised it, it then becomes impossible for other sperm to enter the egg subsequently. Normally what will happen is that the pronuclei from the sperm and the egg will fuse together, restoring the full chromosomal number and cell division and development can take place. However, if two sperm manage to fertilise the egg simultaneously, we then have an excess over the number of chromosomes that we need. In fact, we have three half sets, as it were. And what will normally happen is that the egg will expel one set. And if the surviving set represent a sperm and an egg set, development will continue as normal. However, if the expelled set is the original maternal egg set, then development does not proceed as normal, and a variety of abnormalities can result. Now, obviously, if both sperm were carrying a Y chromosome, you would not expect development to continue. But if one sperm was carrying an X and one sperm is carrying a Y, then there would seem to be no obvious reason why you would not have a normal complement of genes. The fact that development does not proceed normally under those circumstances indicates that the genes themselves are modified by their passage through the germ line. And in this process, only a nucleus which is passed through the female germ line and a sperm which is passed through the male germ line will be capable of giving rise to normal development. Once fertilisation has taken place up at the ampulla of the oviduct, then the fertilised egg is wafted down the oviduct towards the uterus and the cells are dividing as they go. No increase in size is taking place, so at each division the cells of the developing pre-embryo get smaller, halving in size at the first division, becoming quarter size at the second division and so on. By the time it reaches the uterus, it has formed first a ball of cells and then a hollow ball called a blastocyst. Inside the blastocyst is a little group of cells called the inner cell mass. Once this stage has been reached, implantation can take place into the prepared uterine lining. If the embryo hatches from the zona prematurely, then it may implant in the wrong place, for instance in the oviduct itself, in what's known as an ectopic pregnancy. <laughs>